Juliet, my colleague Juliet has explained, Africa currently is facing several um, challenges within the pharmaceutical sector. And one of them that is, she, she, she also mentioned that COVID-19 exposed a lot of vulnerabilities within the African pharmaceutical sector. And one of them was that there are weak supply chain systems, meaning that these systems are not operating efficiently and they are not resilient. And one of the reasons why this is so is because Africa relies mostly on importation. So she mentioned 70 to 90% of medicines from within the continent are imported. This means that the uh, intermediaries involved are several or numerous, and therefore there are several points of entry for counterfeit products. And this also means that currently Africa stands as the highest, carrying the highest burden of counterfeit medications within the, 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 the world or the globe. So we need to make sure that our systems are resilient, that you can be able to ensure tra trace and tracking of this product, real-time visibility of the pharmaceutical products from the manufacturer all the way to the end user who is the, the patient, so that you can ensure that the and falsified medication. And this is why we're actually gathered here today, because we want to explore how can we then make our national supply chain systems more resilient to be able to protect or safeguard the public health. And our presenter for today is Dr. Okidi. Um, just one minute as I, as I present, as I share the bio. Let me know when you can see my screen. Juliet, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, Lucy, you can see your screen. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Okidi will be our presenter for today, and he is the Director Supply Chain at the USAID Strengthening Supply Chain Systems Activity, implemented by MSH. He is a pharmaceutical, public health, and project management professional with over 16 years experience in pharmaceutical and health supply chain systems strengthening at national, regional, and facility level. In his current role, he provides technical oversight for supply chain systems uh, strengthening activity to strengthen the national supply chain and advance its good governance by enhancing an enabling environment through data-driven policy and regulatory frameworks. And with that, I welcome Dr. Okidi to the floor. You are... Hello? Dr. Okidi, are you present? He has just rejoined uh, and he's mm -hmm. saying his mic is disabled. So let me enable it in a few minutes, a few seconds. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My Good afternoon. Audience. Good. So, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, my name has, has been introduced. It's Dennis Okidi. I work for the USA Strengthening Supply Chain Systems Activity, a project uh, implemented by Management Sciences for Health in Uganda. And it's a privilege to share with you some of the uh, work we have done around adopting global standards for commodity traceability. But uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I will be a bit generic. I decided to make it really as an introductory presentation, uh, really giving us the steps 
and uh, reasons why traceability and use of global standards is really critical in uh, any health supply chain system. Um, just confirm that you're able to see my screen in share in slideshow mode. Yes, we are able to see it. All right, so thank you again. So that's the quick presentation outline, really quick definition of traceability, uh, why traceability is important, and also context to the need for global standards, and uh, talking about what standard exists. And I think particularly we need to understand uh, the building blocks of traceability, and then a stepwise approach to adopting global standards uh, in national supply chains before we look at uh, what's the future moving forward once we have adopted global standards. Um, so really, as basics, traceability really refers to uh, the ability to identify um, health products specifically and uh, track them downstream, really when we're doing the distribution to the final consumers, which is uh, the patients or um, clients. And then also being able to track, uh, trace them upstream in its journey, implying that when once we want to know where products are and potentially recall them, we should be able to, from a bird's eye view, uh, know where they are to facilitate their journey backwards. But more importantly, in traceability is the aspect of the change of custody. You're all aware that as medicines and uh, pharmaceuticals move through the supply chain, ownership changes from one warehouse to another, from the pharmaceutical company to the wholesaler, to the hospitals, and then finally to the patient. So traceability really is an aspect of being able to also know uh, where and where, what these items are really uh, lying in the health supply chain. Now, very importantly, for you to be able to conduct any traceability initiative, you must be able to uh, have standards in place that are able to capture the information in a standardized way and then share this standardized information through the supply chain. And the beauty is that for traceability, you don't need to really um, invent the wheel. Most of our digital systems that are existing at uh, country level, whether it be an electronic logistics management information system, a database at central level can be quickly leveraged to enable traceability. What it essentially means is that the unique identifiers of products need to be incorporated with the associated information that needs to be uh, tracked and traced. And uh, then this will flow through these systems. Of course, there could be enhancements because of the amount of information that need to be stored, but whatever digital platform that we do have in place can potentially be leveraged to trace commodities in the national health supply chain. Now, moving on to why traceability is important. And again, this varies from country to country. It depends on the development journey in which the country has uh, attained. But pretty much generically, uh, traceability is very important to prevent, detect, and respond to substandard and falsified medical products in the supply chain. It's very critical in uh, being able to follow through on patient safety concerns, implying that you're able to uniquely identify products that are causing patient safety issues, adverse drug reactions, and so on. It's also very important in circumstances where once you've identified product defects, you are able to efficiently know where these products are lying and then initiate recalls in real time. It's very critical also to enable correct patient records. As I said before, traceability is really about being able to uniquely capture records, usually by a simple scan, and then store it and share it across um, the supply chain. So again, this being able to capture unique records can be tagged to the patient, to the location, which is a health facility, can be tagged to 
um, really the, the distributor, and that's very, very important. It actually facilitates uh, regulatory compliance, quite a bit of uh, traceability initiatives, as you see a bit later in my presentation, really requires statutory instruments that put in place uh, regulatory uh, compliance requirements, like how will you label commodities to include these unique identifiers? And as you label to include these unique identifiers, what are the parameters that you need to include? Is it batch? Is it serial number? Is it the unique identifier? And so on and so forth. But more importantly, traceability also enhances business processes. It's part of the journey from the analog way of managing our health supply chain systems to a digital way, meaning that inventory is captured in real time by scanning and putting it into inventory. We're able to know and optimize exactly where, what quantity of commodities are lying at what point in the supply chain. It's able to be linked to electronic procurement systems where we have our procurement service agents entirely being able to also be tracked. And more importantly, in some advanced supply chains where we do have, for example, uh, <clears throat> the insurance schemes readily available, those can be linked to payment modalities. So you only pay for genuine products that have entered the supply chain. So on the right, you will see really a quick summary of uh, what I would say is the whole purpose of a traceability system. Really one, to make sure we have secure and very safe uh, supply chain <clears throat> and really the safety of a supply chain system is about the product being genuine. And that's where we talk about authenticity. It's about the product being traceable and identifiable as it moves within the supply chain. And that's where we talk about traceability. And again, if we have authenticity, it's about being able to get the product to be identified as a valid product um, manufactured by the right um, manufacturer and uh, has the required security features put by the manufacturer. In traceability, we are able to say where is the commodity and where is it headed downstream? That's when we are talking about tracking. And interesting, we want to locate where the commodity is in the supply chain and who is actually holding this commodity. So that's very critically important. And in our supply chains that have largely been infiltrated by substandard falsified products, traceability provides a very good solution to reading our supply chains of some of these challenges. Um, given the importance of traceability, the World Health Organization has been able to develop policy guidance, a policy paper on traceability of medical products, and um, most um, countries are beginning to actually adopt these um, traceability standards and move to initiatives that will enable the supply chain to be visible, um, custody to be tracked within the supply chain and commodities easily um, lo located within the supply chain in real time. Now, just to give you a quick um, uh, illustration of why standards are very important, this slide really gives you from a real life perspective, if you've been able to move to various countries, you realize that there's so many adapter heads and you may move with your adapter and you go and fail to plug it into power because the standards are different. We've had um, quite a bit of harmonization in standards, for example, for uh, digital systems, uh, charging cables, moving from varied standards to now close to a type C USB charging. Again, that is how standards are beginning to shape the other industries as well. You can see um, also for the um, shoe there, illustratively, the same shoe has been identified in varied sizes in Australia, in Europe, and so on. You will agree with me that uh, even in the pharmaceutical sector, 
if you go pick a product on the shelf, you most often find different um, unique identifiers that have been put on the product for varied uh, regulatory environment. So it means the same product can be sold to Uganda, to Kenya, to the UK, but because we want to meet all their regulatory requirements in terms of labeling and being able to track and trace the product, we are burdened with being able to put things like a QR code, a barcode, and other data matrices on the same uh, pack of the product. Now, moving towards a harmonized system that is applied globally is something that would be very important in uh, bringing down the cost of ensuring manufacturers of pharmaceuticals and medical products meet almost all regulatory requirements globally. Um, so again, um, just quickly uh, emphasizing the need for global traceability standards and why global standards offer uh, several benefits over locally defined standards. Just to note that even in country, you can actually develop your own um, unique identifiers that most countries do have. We have countries that have their national product catalogs that have products identified uniquely uh, and labeled variedly. But again, those now are only used within the confines of that country. For global traceability, we want these same standards to be helping tracking and tracing commodities outside of the confines of one uh, sovereign border. So the benefits that come with that is really wide acceptability across various stakeholders, manufacturers globally, big um, retailers and wholesalers, uh, development partners have queued in to actually accept and use these fam familiar standards that will be used across the countries. A uh, very important um, aspect is the ability to enhance interoperability of uh, data across uh, countries for the same set of standards. You're all aware that even in country, uh, most of our countries in Africa face a problem of sharing data from facility level to the center because most often they use different product identifiers, labeling products variedly. Amoxil, for example, Amoxil 500 milligram tablet and tablet Amoxil 500 milligram. When you now start to go in the digital systems, will be recognized as different items. And yet, when we have a unique identifier, you will not have a problem with uniquely identifying this. Uh, they are varied off the shelf hardware that would be really critical in actually uh, supporting these traceability initiatives, ranging from uh, scanning devices to actually um, other hardware that would be used for storage and interoperability of these um, systems. And then, of course, you don't reinvent the wheel. You really start off with a very low operational cost because you are adopting uh, what others have thought through and is being used uh, widely. Then, of course, very importantly, governance and uh, management of these varied um, standards, standards data sets across the supply chain would be already defined that you can adopt to the context. So again, uh, WHO provides quite a bit of guidance in that regard, and uh, the, the benefits are quite, quite clear. Now, just to give you a picture of uh, how traceability can actually uh, give us huge, huge benefits, you realize that uh, WHO has reported these statistics in various reports that one in 10 med medical products uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa is actually uh, either substandard or uh, falsified. Um, due to those substandard and falsified uh, products, we can uh, attribute about 500,000 deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa to that. And the volume of substandard products that are moving around in the African context are close to 50 million US dollars. So once you implement traceability, on a national scale, you'll be able to, one, rid yourself of some of these uh, opportunity costs that you see are really high. Now, of course, the question is what global traceability standards exist? And I would say that uh, there are many, 
Others have uh, been used in a um, few countries. Some are really one country specific um, unique identifiers and standards, but we do have GS1, which is Global Standards 1, which is really widely used even uh, across Africa now, and other standards like uh, the ISBT 128 that uh, is for blood uh, products specifically. But importantly, uh, what I wanted to, to bring home in this slide is that across Africa, we do have uh, many countries already having a traceability strategy. And those are the countries you see in um, blue. And these are records of uh, close to six, seven months ago. And then, of course, there are countries that have not started initiatives at all. Those are the ones in gray. There's no data. Then there are countries that have started active discussions uh, actually to begin to put in place traceability strategies and a national plan to track and trace commodities in the national supply chain. And that's the majority, the dark blue. And of course, there are countries where there are regulations in place and uh, traceability initiatives have started. So again, this is now beginning to uh, move towards the global movement where products will be largely identified globally with unique identifiers that can be shared across countries, and that brings enormous benefits in the long run. Now, what are the building blocks of traceability? Now, for you to be able to trace uh, products in your supply chain, you need to be able to, one, uniquely identify these products, and you need to be able to identify the product you need to be able to identify the units of the product, meaning in the way in which they are packed. Products come packed in the primary packaging, secondary, tertiary packaging, and the cartons. So all those will be potential areas of uniquely identifying this product such that there is no opportunity for entry of counterfeits into our supply chain. Um, you need to be able to uniquely identify locations Locations meaning health facilities, manufacturing industries, and any other legal uh, entity. And those would be having unique identifiers that can be globally shared and cannot be duplicated. The other very important aspect in uh, traceability is you should be able to capture data in an efficient, quick way digitally. And uh, all of you do agree that if you go to supermarkets, you will be uh, seeing the use of scanners that uh, pick information from barcodes as they pick out the product cost before you're issued with the receipt at payment. Now, that is what we would also want to see in the uh, pharmaceutical or supply chains, where these unique identifiers are put on the products by way of barcodes, by way of radio frequency uh, identification uh, devices, and many other. Uh, data capture uh, platforms. Now, once you've been able to uniquely identify the product and provide for data capture uh, stickers or uh, implants on the products, the next important aspect is how does this information flow within the supply chain? It should be able to flow um, downstream from the highest point possible, that is the national medicines regulatory authorities as the commodities enter into the country if they're imported or as they get out of the production line if the manufacturing is local. Then we should be able to, of course, also define how data will be shared um, across the supply chains. And this is something that needs to be clearly defined. As you see a bit later, there are very many guidelines that need to be clearly developed to really support implementation of traceability initiatives. And they are, of course, privacy and confidentiality issues. And um, most times, if you are the importer or manufacturer, you should be having the privilege of seeing your supply chain downstream, meaning you know where your, 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 your products are. And uh, for the regulator, um, they should be able to have the bird's eye view of practically everything uh, in the supply chain. So those are very core as we plan to adopt traceability standards in our national health supply chains. Now, 
these are very quick steps of uh, how we can really adopt traceability standards. And these are generic. It varies uh, depending on, of course, contexts within the country. But these are like steps that are at the minimum required for us to be certain that once you follow them, you will be able to effectively have adopted these standards and set in place the systems to implement them in your national health supply chains. So one is really to define your objectives of uh, being and wishing to track and trace uh, commodities in your supply chain. And I talked about this before. Is it patient safety? Is it that your recalls have been bad and you need to be able to set in place systems where your recall is instant? Have we had big challenges around record keeping at facilities, incorrect prescriptions and dispensing of commodities? Or you just want to improve the robustness of your regulatory systems, or it's about improving business processes. In quite a number of our supply chains, there are really concerns around patient safety, there are concerns around visibility of products in the supply chain, meaning you want to be able to get your supply chains to be proof to counterfeit, but also proof to pilferage. And so these need to be clearly defined uh, before you begin to move any traceability initiatives. And as you can see, these will then be four aspects of your traceability strategy that you need to put in place before moving to implement these standards. Now, once you've defined your traceability objectives, this will now lead to you thinking through your model of traceability that you want to implement. Just um, picking in place three broad objectives, which is improving patient safety, improving payment monitoring for systems where uh, payment is linked to either um, uh, uh, commodities being authentic before they're issued in uh, their health supply chain um, systems, and so on and so forth. Or you just want to improve the efficiency of the supply chain. Now, broadly, um, the traceability models that exist are about three, and I'll try to talk to them in a minute. The centralized system of traceability is one where every um, point in the supply chain is traceable by way of a traceability event. Now, the centralized system normally is a system where the central uh, Regulatory authority has the overall mandate of initiating entry into the supply chain of a medical product, tracking it at every step as it moves from the manufacturer or at the ports of entry to the intermediate distributors to the health facilities and down to the patient level. Now, this is the most robust system where you can be able to minimize counterfeits close to 100%. You'll be able to have 100% visibility where the products are, are they expired? You can instantly recall them because the regulator would always have a very good bird's eye view of where the product is. It'll 100% facilitate any payment processes uh, reimbursements for medical insurance schemes for the, the medicines and also enable very efficient uh, management of commodities within the various aspects of the supply chain. Then we have the distributed system where we do have um, each of the players in the supply chain being mandated to share aspects of product identification as they enter their supply chains to the regulator. So this is more less uh, driven by the actors in the supply chain rather than the regulator. And they need to have systems in place, not dictated 100% in terms of what kind of system, but prescribed minimal requirements of information that need to be shared, uh, both upstream and downstream would be important. Again, this is very critical. It can help to read 
counterfeits in the supply chain. Definitely is going to improve visibility and inventory management within the various um, levels of the supply chain. But since it's not centrally managed and driven by uh, the regulator, for example, you would not be able to uh, benefit from the use in uh, improvement of payment monitoring for whatever reason uh, for that matter. Now, the other system is the point of dispense verification. And here, what literally um, the objective would be is that as medicines are being issued out to the patients, they are validated for being authentic, meaning they are duly um, uh, required to be in that supply chain. And also they are manufactured by the right manufacturer. They are not counterfeit. And so that system is really um, able to rid us of counterfeit, but also because it's a requirement to just authenticate that this is a genuine product. Uh, it can be used at the uh, point of dispensing to actually do reimbursements for uh, commodities in places where we do have health insurance and any form of co-payment for pharmaceuticals. Now, those are the broad models. And again, as countries begin to think about adopting uh, traceability, they need to be very clear on which model they will be going for. Or, and as I mentioned before, the centralized system would be one that would be the most robust, but again, would be the most expensive in terms of putting in place all the systems and data requirements in place. Now, as a step three, once you've defined your traceability model, it's very important to begin thinking about what's the scope, how are you going to implement it, and what's the time frame. And again, here we are beginning to think through, do we need to track all commodities in the national health supply chain? Do we need to track and trace commodities that are potentially of interest to particular groups? Maybe ARVs, maybe vaccines, maybe narcotics, and so on and so forth. So again, these need to be defined and depends on our traceability objectives. We should be very clear on what we need to be able to start with the traceability journey. Then, of course, pretty critically, the time frame needs to be guided by implementation guidelines. And as you can see, uh, those um, books that you see on the right are strategies that have so far been developed by countries that now have adopted um, one or the, or the other standard global traceability initiatives for tracking and tracing in their national health supply chain. This one is from Nigeria and uh, Ghana. But after the strategy is in place, what's more important is being able to give all stakeholders the required awareness and planning to put in place systems to adopt. And that's where the guidelines have to come in. And in the guidelines, normally they define exactly what will be traced by when will the traceability initiatives kick, kick, kick into play and uh, what will be the laboring requirements such that for wholesalers that need to import, they need to import from compliant uh, manufacturers. For manufacturers who need to sell to countries, they need to be able to adapt to meet the regulatory requirements. And for, of course, the in-country supply chain, there needs to be a period of time uh, within which the various stakeholders would be given the opportunity to set in place the systems to track and trace, including buying the scanning devices, putting in place the digital platforms to store this information and share within the supply chain. Then as a fourth step, and this now really um, lies on mainly the um, regulator and the policy makers, we need to be able to define how this information would be uh, exchanged within uh, the supply chain. And again, here you need to be able to agree on what global standard are you going to use. Majority of countries are using GS1, Global Standards 1, to actually um, track products in their supply chains. But as I said before, there are many other electronic 
uh, product codes that we can use. And uh, of course, after you've agreed on what standard, very important, now you need to be able to start putting in place the national traceability architecture. You will see uh, in the slide after that uh, it's really a very core foundational element of any traceability initiative. Where will this unique product identification or supply chain event information be stored? It needs to be stored. It needs to be captured efficiently before it can be shared. And so we need to be able to think through uh, how, where will our master data, meaning unique product identification, be stored? Where will our transactional data be stored and moving through the supply chain, as well as other event data uh, that will be generated as we scan and capture and share this information? Now, I just wanted to give you a glimpse, and this is really now still on the same step four of the complexity that is involved. Really what is important is master data for all um, what we need to be able to track. And master data involves the basic information, what is the product code, unique identifier, what is the product description. Maybe I'm, if I use the example of a Moxil, Moxil 500 milligram tablet, uh, USB, whatever standard you have used. Then you need some other details. What is the product categorization in terms of maybe it's an antibiotic? What is the ATC code, for example? All those information can be safely stored in that master data that need to be exchanged downstream. What's the strength uh, of the product? Uh, what's the packaging? What's the shelf life? And all other information that's related to the product. Now, this unique master data information uh, needs to be shared across from manufacturer to procurers to donors, to the National Medicines Regulator Authority, NDA for that matter in Uganda, um, joint medical stores or the warehouses across the countries like in Uganda, we do have two medical stores, joint medical stores and national medical stores. And uh, this information uh, needs to be used for all the supply chain planning processes beginning from identifying products that need to enter the supply chain, what needs to go into procurement, um, what needs to go into our inventory management systems, distribution systems, point of dispensing systems, and finance and insurance systems, all being linked at the end of the day to a patient. And uh, once you have all that figured out, this information then will be uh, safely put on the smallest unit possible of the product. Most countries have a minimum of at least a unique identifier being put on the secondary pack, implying that um, if it is, for example, a box of amoxicillin, uh, 100 tablets on that box, you will have a unique identifier with the details I've talked about and the serial number that is unique to that uh, box of amoxicillin. So again, each of the aggregate uh, next packaging size would then be required to have that and links to the previous. Uh, it implies that you, for example, if I use an illustration of the GS1 um, approach, they will then have um, the, the tablet or the capsule uh, being actually in the primary pack, which is a a bottle uniquely identified by a sticker that has all those unique details. And then at each level of aggregation, you'd have unique identifiers that can be linked to the previous lower level unique identifiers. So that really proves our supply chain of counterfeits because immediately you find a box is missing, you need to report because as you scan, it tells you um, the quantity of the products, but also what are their unique identifiers. Now, this is moved through the supply chain at all the levels, as I said before. And then, of course, we need to have very clear uh, exchange of information guidelines uh, to make sure that integrity of the data is maintained, but also, more importantly, um, confidentiality is kept. So these are very core components of any 
process to adopt any global standard to be used in the national health supply chains that we do have. Now, as I go towards a uh, close, um, when we have adopted these standards, what do we want to see at the end of the day? Um, the upper side of the slide really talks to where we are in terms of our traceability journey for most of the countries where we have, we are unable to accurately locate the products in our supply chain. We are unable to uh, really do any recalls. And uh, once we implement traceability standards, we should be able to, using the unique identifiers and the serials, be able to do recalls very effectively. Um, in the national level, MOH and uh, central level players, we do lack actual consumption and real-time inventory for planning that comes from downstream in the supply chain. And once you have traceability systems in place where data is shared in real time, you would have actually access to a very accurate and timely consumption data that can be used for national level uh, for casting um, and supply planning um, and really uh, advocacy for financing where they're financing gaps. We are unable in most of our warehouses to track the products beyond where we have supplied them. And once we implement traceability standards, we should be able to do better tracking and tracing uh, from the manufacturer till the patient from a warehouse perspective. At health facilities, um, we struggle to address inventory losses, including expiries and leakages, because sometimes our digital platforms are not well um, wired towards being able to give us all that detail, but also largely most of our facilities still are in analog mode. So when we implement traceability standards, we should be able to really get alerted to any of these inventory issues, including expiries, discrepancies, and so on and so forth. And then of course, at the patient level, currently, as I said before, we are estimating um, from the WHO reports about 500,000 deaths annually from uh, falsified and counterfeit medication in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we are not able to differentiate between genuine and falsified products, largely in most of our supply chains at the patient level. But when we implement traceability standards, we should be able to accurately verify the medicines before consumption with just a simple scan using a mobile phone. And so that's the power of implementing traceability in our supply chains. And just to give you um, one live example of how traceability uh, implemented in a national supply chain has been able to reap huge benefits, the best use case that we do have globally is in Turkey, where they've implemented the Turkish pharmaceutical and trace system. There are challenges, as I said before, you need to be clear on your traceability objectives, was really to ensure that and guarantee reliable supply of legitimate drugs to patients in Turkey. At the time when they initiated this uh, decade plus ago, they were actually grappling with counterfeit commodities coming into Turkey and uh, really um, putting their patients at risk, but also uh, putting their local manufacturers at risk because then they would come in cheaper and uh, falsified as made um, from genuine manufacturers. So in um, their response to this, they developed a, a national-wide centralized um, system for tracking and tracing. And uh, you can see the results that they were able to reap they now have a reliable and safe supply of drugs, almost 100% uh, proof of counterfeits. Um, they have enhanced the ability to combat illicit drugs and barcode scams, meaning once they scan and there is an issue, it is flagged off immediately and investigated up to the point of where the commodity is entered into the Turkish uh, supply chain. The regulator is immediately notified once they have a hit 
from an illicit commodity that has been scanned either for reimbursement or sale to patients in private pharmacies. So currently, they do have more than uh, 45 million daily transactions, meaning daily scanning of these unique identifiers and product packs to validate authenticity and also confirm the chain of custody of the product. And uh, with the system that has been developed, they're able to really respond in real time um, to any a hit that, that 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 comes through in terms of a counterfeit or falsified product in their supply chain. And uh, what they've been able to reap so far is more than $1 billion in the period of implementation, which is uh, probably a decade in uh, making sure that their local manufacturers are not outcompeted by the relatively cheaper falsified products that, that come through. So this is a real live example of a success story by full um, implementation of traceability standards in a national health supply chain. We're yet to get there for most of the African countries, as I said before, but initiatives have started. And we think that um, this is really just a matter of time before we begin to experience such beautiful uh, success stories. So with that, I thank you very much for uh, listening, and I turn back to uh, Lucy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doc, for that elaborate presentation. Uh, we have learned a lot on how track and trace operates and what are the benefits associated with it, especially with the last case example that you've given of Turkey. And I see there are already several questions. For those who also have questions, feel free to raise your hand and we'll be able to unmute you or just post them in the chat as well. So the first question here that we have are, is what investments are being made to ensure stakeholders at the last mile are engaged in use of these traceability tools to authenticate products? Okay, so do I respond to them one by one? You see? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so, so I think um, the investments differ from um, country to country, but what I can say is that uh, as a starting point, um, the governments need to uh, work with all stakeholders to really develop a national owned and agreed upon traceability strategy. And uh, those who lay out the clear objectives of why the country is moving towards uh, adopting global standards for traceability. But more importantly, also, uh, post the strategy, there will be guidelines where each and every stakeholder will need to be clearly uh, enlightened on what are the investments. The investments are not ideally small, and it varies. Uh, for example, if you take a manufacturer, for you to be able to start to manufacture commodities that have unique identifiers put on it. Um, for example, it should take you a few hundred um, thousand dollars for each production line. But again, the benefits of investing in this would uh, really outweigh the cost because you are sure that your, your products will be uniquely identified where they are. You are sure that you are now able to uh, move one step into the global market because you have identifiers that can be picked up globally. So it's it's a hefty investment for a very um, um, beneficial opportunity cost in the future. So I think um, what normally is important is that the key stakeholders, including the manufacturers, including the wholesalers in the chain, need to be provided with uh, the time to be able to plan for the investments. In um, some instances, of course, um, some players that have particular interests could be able to, for example, kickstart some of the investments uh, in the country. Um, probably big donors could fund the development of the strategy, and maybe uh, do some proof of concept with one or two manufacturers. But again, because they have a business interest in this for the benefits that they will have 
now enter into a bigger market, they will have um, kind of proofed their supply chain of counterfeits. They do have an interest in this, but they just need to be able to be given the time to plan to make these strategic investments. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I believe that has answered the question. Um, the next question is what cons considering the global nature of pharmaceutical supply chains and being there are different IT systems, how do we guarantee interoperability of such systems or this will emerge as a hurdle later in the process? Yeah, so thank you, Lucy, and thank you for the question. So I think interoperability of uh, systems is something that has been uh, becoming more and more um, studied over time. What I do know is that from an IT perspective, almost every system can talk to any other system. What is important is the ability of the users to identify what nature of information needs to be shared and the IT folks should be able to develop what they call application programming interfaces that allow for information to be shared from one system to another. Of course, uh, if systems are similar, uh, both upstream and downstream, the interoperability challenges are less, but I do believe that interoperability is a hurdle that is a thing of the past because most of our systems are now online systems and online systems are easy to actually program them to talk to each other. As long as what you need to share is clearly defined and uh, the method of exchange of this information is also clearly defined and the exchange platforms are in place. As I mentioned before, one important uh, aspect of any traceability system is actually the traceability architecture. In that traceability architecture, you need to have what we call the interoperability layer, where information is picked up from one system and sent to another system. And so that needs to be planned at a national level uh, because the storage requirements would be really something that needs to be planned strategically because the volume of information that will be stored, both the master data and transactional data would be huge. So again, that's something that uh, needs to be planned um, strategically financed for all these to, to actually work smoothly. But yes, that should be practically possible for any system. And as I said before, most of our digital supply chain systems can be leveraged to actually perform the functions of interoperability, but also track commodities down the supply chain. And on that, thank you for that. And on the same, um, is there a financing mechanisms? Uh, are there financing mechanisms for the IT systems? Because you said that for the um, interoperability to layer, you need to it needs to be implemented at at a national level due to the volume of information. So that means that in terms of resourcing, both technical and financial, it's gonna be quite hefty. So who is gonna what, what sources of financing are there available for that? Yeah, so, so I think this again will fall back to uh, the governments. Most times there are already systems at uh, national level, whether for reporting on um, uh, more of the other health uh, service related data that come from facility level to the center. There are systems and um, uh, that allow for data exchange between the Ministry of Health, for example, and the Ministry of, uh, of, of, of uh, Finance or any other ministries within the country. So again, the foundation of that largely in most of our African countries exist. I think what now we need to think about is, is the foundation sufficient to take on the extra tasks and volume of data that needs to come through with interoperability of product information that needs to be passed across the supply chain? The answer can be yes. What if it is yes, then it means it's just picking up quite a bit of the, the applications that graciously are being uh, largely developed 
and made available uh, in, so to speak, what I would say, um, open source applications, uh, where you, for example, have a few open source applications that can be further developed to be able to scan um, products at the point of dispensing, and they can be downloaded on, let's say, uh, Android or iOS uh, phones. Then you do have uh, fairly complicated systems that also are being developed by several partnerships. For example, I've heard about the interoperability platform, where if now the interoperability platform is finalized, it will be able to share unique product identification across um, various supply chains. I've heard of uh, initiatives like uh, the Trust, which has been very helpful in actually providing um, countries with the ability to initiate traceability initiatives for vaccines, uh, where they already have unique product identifiers for vaccines. You just need to tap in and anchor your systems to get information from uh, that platform. So again, what's important is really um, looking at what systems exist, uh, what is out there in terms of freeware that you can tap into, and then um, on a country and case-by-case -case basis, looking at the financing options that are there. But given that these are national priorities to be able to read supply chains of uh, counterfeits, protect the patients, governments largely need to be uh, also a, an active participant in funding some of these initiatives, although donors can come in on specific aspects that are of interest to them. Thank you for that elaborate response. It's clearly answered the question. So we have another question. Um, how could efficient traceability of pharmaceuticals be implemented in private supply chains? Yeah, so thank you. So I think for the private supply chains, they are not uh, delinked from the public supply chain. Normally, the ministries of health uh, have mandate for both the public and the private supply chains. Um, and the regulatory authorities do provide oversight for regulation of traceability initiatives in both supply chains. So again, depending on the traceability model, um, all these stakeholders will be, will be well covered in terms of what their roles would be and what they need to put in place to actually um, implement traceability initiatives, specifically for the Turkey's example where you see they have been able to implement full traceability. Uh, all the private sector, pharmacies, hospitals are on board. Um, they are using this to actually, at the point of verification, check that the commodities they are dispensing to the patients who are largely covered under their national health insurance schemes are genuine. So what it means is that at the scan and authentication of the product being genuine, they can then be reimbursed for the cost of medicine that they are offering uh, to the patients under the health insurance scheme. So definitely they are on board and uh, they would need to be putting in place systems that can link to the central level authentication platforms that then of course are driven by the regulatory authorities and government. And so it's a journey, if I must also um, say, it normally starts off with uh, what are the objectives. If the country wants to start off with beginning to read their public supply chains of, uh, of counterfeit or beginning to bring visibility in their public supply chains that are normally struggling to, 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 to provide the required accountability for commodities, they could start from there. But incrementally, traceability initiatives reap the biggest outcomes when they're implemented at a national scale for both the public and the private sector. But all depends on the phased approach of implementation. Sometimes they start off with uh, just, for example, narcotics because they're expensive, they want to avoid drug abuse, they scale up to vaccines, the next thing would be ARVs. But in the strategic um, scheme of things, it needs to be incremental towards a full track and trace for the entire supply chain for both the public and the private. 
Thank you for that. Um, I believe that has answered Matilda's question. And I'm just gonna take us back one question away. So on the question for the resourcing for the implementation of the IT systems, those are a follow-up question to that on you mentioned that both uh, NGOs and government can provide the resources. So there's a question on are there any development partners currently funding or ex have expressed interest to fund the operationalization at country or multi-country level? Um, I think that's that's something that I would need to dig up a bit more. But as I said, um, for example, for vaccines, the trust initiative for tracking vaccines has been largely funded by UNICEF. And uh, once you want to track and start with vaccines, you can quickly uh, link up with the UNICEF team in, in country and uh, be able to uh, get the necessary help you need to get started. Um, there are a few other initiatives. I did talk about also the interoperability platform where um, this um, similar to trust, there's an expansion that is now happening to include um, unique identifiers for other products. Again, this is uh, something that is in the works, but I think for vaccines, definitely, that's already well developed. We just need to queue in and tap in. But for the others, there's large um, work for the countries to be able to foot some of the bills to get this started. Yeah, but uh, I think it depends on a country by country uh, situation, but each of the, the countries can quickly get to their core development partners and have a discussion and say, we need to move this direction. Is there support that you can provide? And they will be able to look at what they can support with that is already well developed, like these initiatives I've talked about, or potentially fund a small proof of concept that then government can use to implement on a national scale. So it varies country by country. All right, thank you for that. Um, so we have another question on, will it be feasible to implement this across any national supply chain maturity level, considering that various countries are at different levels of supply chain maturity? By this, I think, uh, Samuel means GS1. If I'm correct. Samuel, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so so I think the maturity of a supply chain is an important uh, factor in implementation of traceability initiatives. And what I can say is that traceability relies on the ability for you to capture information, store and transmit. So it means that there need to be foundational aspects of digital systems already in place that are capable of doing that. So if your supply chain is largely analog, uh, paper-based, of course, traceability initiatives will be hard to implement. So it's easier to implement traceability initiatives when the supply chain systems are maturing and uh, the higher you are in the maturity um, gradient, the easier it is to leverage on the systems that took you to that maturity level to implement these traceability initiatives. All right, uh, thank you for that. I think one last question for me is wrapping up. Um, you mentioned that GS1 is the one that has been mostly adopted by many countries. So yet there are several others that are also in place. For traceability. So is there are there any advantages that are associated with GS1 that make it popularly used among the countries that are currently using it? Um, I would say that's a difficult question to, to answer in terms of an advantage for, for GS1, but I think for sure they were innovative in terms of uh, being able to come up with an elaborate product unique identification system. Um, they are adapting to include um, unique identifiers for medical devices, blood products. And so 
um, what I said before that if there's already something, why reinvent the wheel? So most people really just went ahead to adopt that, but I don't think um, there's any substantial advantage over the others, other than the ability now to uh, relate to many more markets if you adopt GS1 because of the scale of implementation in which they have reached. Uh, closely, almost half the countries globally have some form of GS1 implementation, particularly for the developed um, countries as well. But that doesn't mean that uh, there is no move towards some, some countries developing some things of their own. But uh, I think for us, given that uh, we need to be able to be efficient, not reinvent the wheel as Africa, this is something that would um, move us uh, a needle quicker than when we start to do our own um, traceability identification system and uh, move from scratch. So I think no big advantages other than it's widely used, so why not use it as opposed to reinventing the wheel? And uh, it gives the obvious advantage of being able to uh, be uniquely identified across multiple countries that are now using it and uh, the entry for markets for our small manufacturers that would be instantly provided if they adopt GS1 at national level. Thank you, Lucy. Um, thank you for that, Dr. Okiti. Um, so I can see that, that one of the many benefits, of, one of the biggest benefits is that you would relate more to uh, more markets. You would relate to more markets with adoption of GS1. So you've also mentioned that Several countries are coming up with several systems. People are coming up with their own systems of traceability. So this means that interoperability will also be affected, especially for the <clears> private <throat> sector. So what would be your advice on how this can be addressed and what are the challenges that the private sector might encounter with the different systems that will be in operation? Yeah, so so I, I, I would say that um, the developments around being able to have uh, data matrices that actually uh, as much as possible take care of all the unique product identification systems and standards globally is a subject of discussion that is starting. What it means is that you still have a single product identification uh, matrix that by a scan is able to give you maybe GS1, is able to give you any other electronic product coding system, plus uh, all the other things. It would also potentially give you in the future the electronic product leaflet. So that means you don't need to put a physical product leaflet in the pack. So I think as uh, supply chains mature, one thing that uh, definitely is going to come into play is the ability for us to uh, recognize that there is diversity. If a country wants to develop their own, that's fine. But from a regulatory perspective, if they develop their own and we are able to carry it and put it in the same identification system that is encrypted by, for example, data matrix, then that is going to ease uh, still the, the burden of interoperability because you just need to be able to queue into that uh, platform where all these things are added into one data matrix. So that means by a scan, you should be able to pick up what is it that your country requirements are aligned to. Is it GS1 or is it another electronic product uh, catalog system? But the, the burden of multiple um, barcodes, multiple matrices will be solved by one single matrix that has everything that is required to identify a product across various markets. So I think that's the way to go. And there have been some discussions that are happening towards that already. Uh, all right, thank you so much for that. You've clearly answered it. And I think with that, um, there, is no more, there are no more questions on the chat and I can't see any hands up. So we can now wind up the session. And before we wind up, I'd like to just do a reminder or just announce that African Pharmaceutical Network is launching a pharmaceutical supply chain course. And the course is actually starting tomorrow. Cohort 1 intake is ongoing with classes starting tomorrow. 
from and the classes will be from 9 a.m. to um, 11 a.m. East African time. So if you want to impact the pharmaceutical supply chain system, strengthen it on a broader scale and also your national um, supply chain systems and contribute to them being more resilient, then the, this needs you to be a competent supply chain officer or expert. So you need to have the right training you know, to, to be able to equip you to be able to um, contribute to this greater cause. And with that, I think they, there are no more announcements for me. And I just want to thank everyone, the participants. Thank you for your active participation through the questions. And also by being here with us, you know, it's a Friday afternoon. Um, can you please send the link to the course? Yes, Juliet, please help me share the link to the course. So I think I forgot to mention the course runs for three months with classes happening once a week. And that the classes will be every Saturday on that particular time, 9 to 11 a.m. VAT. Um, and the cost is actually $300. So yes, I was thanking the participants. And thank you so much for attending and taking this Friday afternoon to be here with us. Thank you so much to Dr. Okidi. We have learned a lot from you. And thank you for your patience as well with the questions. I know they were a lot. So we really appreciate that. And with that, I wish you all a lovely evening. Um, Dr. Kidi, do you have any last remarks that you'd wish to give us? No, just to say thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, sharing our experiences with you. And hopefully we can have detailed engagements later. Thank you. Yes, yes, definitely. We look forward to working together again. And also a reminder that we will share the lecture, the, the session. It was recorded, so if you were not able to sit through the entire session, you'll be able to share the materials, both the slides and the recording.